If you take someone like Dostoevsky, who I think is a favorite of mine, by the way, I would highly recommend that you read all five of his great novels because they are unparalleled in their psychological depth. Um, and so if you're interested in psychology, Dostoevsky's the person for you. Tolstoy is more of a sociologist, but Dostoevsky, man, he gets right down into the bottom of the questions and messes around. Uh, uh, transformative reading. Anyways, Dostoevsky's characters, this character named Raskolnikov, is a character in uh, Crime and Punishment, and Raskolnikov is a materialist, rationalist, I would say, um, which was a ra rather new type of person back in the 1880s, and he was sort of taken by the idea that God was dead and took and convinced himself that the only reason that he that anyone acted in a moral way, in a traditional way, was because of cowardice. They were unable to remove from them the restrictions of mere convention and act in the manner of someone who rose above the norm. And so he's tortured by these ideas. He's half starving, he's a law student, he doesn't have enough to eat, he doesn't have much money, and so you know, he's not thinking all that clearly either. And he's got a lot of family problems. His mother's sick and she can't spend him, send him much money. And his sister is planning to um, engage in a marriage that's loveless to someone who's rather tyrannical, who he, she hopes will provide the family with enough money so that he can continue in law school. And they write him brave letters telling him that she's very much in love with this guy, but he is smart enough to read between the lines and realizes that his sister is just planning to prostitute herself in, you know, in an altruistic manner, and he's not very happy with that. And then, at the same time, as all this is happening, he becomes aware of this pawnbroker who he's, you know, pawning his last possessions to, and she's a horrible person, and not only by his estimation, she pawns a lot of things for the neighborhood, and people really don't like her. She's grasping and cruel and deceitful, and and resentful, and like, and she has this niece who's not very bright, intellectually impaired, whom she basically treats as a slave and beats all the time. And so Raskolnikov, you know, involved in this mess, and half starved and a bit delirious, um, and possessed of these strange new nihilistic ideas, decides that the best way out of this situation would be just to kill the land, the uh, pawnbroker, take her wealth which she, all she does is keep it in a chest, uh, free the niece, so that seems like a good idea, uh, so remove one apparently horrible and useless person from the world, free his sister from the necessity of this loveless marriage, and allow him to go to law school where he can become educated and do some good for the world. You know, so one of the things that's lovely about Dostoevsky is that he, you know, when, sometimes when one person is arguing against another or when they're having an argument in their head, they make their opponent into a straw man, which is basically they take their opponent and caricature their perspective and try to make it as weak as possible and, and laugh about it. And, and then they come up with their argument and destroy the straw man and feel that they've obtained victory. But it's a very pathetic way of thinking. It's not thinking at all. What thinking is, is when you adopt the opposite position from your suppositions and you make that argument as strong as you can possibly make it. And then you pit your perspective against that, that strong iron man, not the straw man, and you argue it out, you battle it out. And that's what Dostoevsky does in his novels. I mean, he's the people who stand for the antithesis of what Dostoevsky actually believes are often the strongest, smartest, and sometimes most admirable people in the book. And so, he takes great moral courage to do that. And, uh, you know, in Raskolnikov, what he wanted to do was set up a character who had every reason to commit murder. Every reasonable reason. Philosophically, practically, ethically even. Well, so Raskolnikov goes and uh, he kills the old lady with an axe. And it doesn't go the way he expects it will, because what he finds out is that post-murder Raskolnikov and pre-murder Raskolnikov are not the same people at all. They're not even close to the same people. He's entered an entirely different universe. 
and Dostoevsky does a lovely job of describing that universe of horror and chaos and 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 deception and 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 suffering and terror and all of that and he doesn't even use the money he just buries it in a in an alley as fast as he can and then doesn't want anything to do with it again and anyways the reason i'm telling you all this is po potentially to entice you into reading the book because it is an amazing amazing book but also because you might say well is Ris is what happened to raskolnikov true are the stories in that book true and the answer to that is well from a factual perspective, clearly they're untrue, but then if you think of Raskolnikov as the embodiment of a particular type of person who lived at that time, and the embodiment of a certain kind of ideology which had swept across Europe and really invaded Russia, and which was actually a precursor, uh, a philosophical precursor to the Russian Revolution, then Raskolnikov is more real than any one person. He's like a composite person. He's like a person who's irrelevancies have been eliminated for the purpose of relating something about the structure of the world and so I like to think of those things as sort of meta-real meta-real they're more real than real and of course that's what you expect people to do when they tell you about their own lives about their own day you don't want a factual description of every muscle twitch you want them to distill their experiences down into the gist which is the significance of the experience and the significance of the experience is roughly what you can derive from listening to the experience that will change the way that you look at the world and act in the world so it's valuable information and they can tell you a terrible story and that can be valuable because that can tell you how not to look in the world look at the world and act in it, or they can tell you a positive story, you can derive benefit either way, which is why we also like to go watch stories about horrible psychopathic thugs, um, you know, and, and hopefully we're learning not to be like them, although there are additional advantages in that, you know, someone who, you might be some, say that someone who is incapable of cruelty is a higher moral being than someone who is capable of cruelty and I would say, and this follows Jung as well, that that's incorrect and it's dangerously incorrect because if you are not capable of cruelty you are absolutely a victim to anyone who is and so part of the reason that people go watch anti-heroes and villains is because there's a part of them crying out for the incorporation of the monster within them which is what gives them strength of character and self-respect because it's impossible to respect yourself until you grow teeth and if you grow teeth then you realize that you're somewhat dangerous and or maybe somewhat seriously dangerous and then you might be more willing to demand that you treat yourself with respect and other people do the same thing and so that doesn't mean that being cruel is better than not being cruel what it means is that being able to be cruel and then not being cruel is better than not being able to be cruel because in the first case you're nothing but weak and naive and in the second case you're dangerous but you have it under control